Hey, it's Scott. Welcome back to Spin Magazine's Lip Service. My next guest, Mark McGrath, the singer of Sugar Ray. He's got some great stories. I think you're going to really enjoy this interview. We get into everything from how they bamboozled Atlantic Records into giving them a record deal with only two songs, how Howard Stern was very pivotal getting them the record deal, and how... Unbelievably, he almost quit the band over their biggest song, Fly, which went on to sell them millions of copies. Mark is a true professional. It's a great interview. I think you're going to really enjoy this. He knows more about music than almost anyone I've ever met in my life, besides maybe Matt Pinfield. Um, so I hope you really enjoy this. Coming up in just a moment, Mark McGrath of Sugar Ray. <laughs> Welcome to the show, the one and the only, Mark McGrath. How are you, my brother? We're just catching up. Yeah, man. It's funny. It's like, you know, we know each other, but we don't know each other as well as we should for the re, uh, people that we know, yeah. you know? So it's an honor to be here. Congratulations, Scott. Thank you, bro. Kill it on this. Thank you, thank you. Everybody you bring on, I'm a huge fan of, so thank I don't you. know what I'm doing here, but I'm grateful to be here. Well, and it's great to have you. I will tell you a funny story. The internet is a funny place, as you it's know. And you, I know you get, what you're going to say. You get some hate, you get some love, and everyone on the internet's like, There's I, hate on the internet, Scott? <laughs> yeah. I'm, like, I'm the guy in Sugar Ray. I get hate? Come on. Like, I didn't know that Mark Mark McGrath had a podcast. <laughs> I get this almost every day. So I'm like, I think Mark McGrath should be on the podcast. So. Well, well, I'm honored. It's funny. And a friend we mentioned here, Gina, shout out to Gina and Josh. Uh, yeah. Gina sent me something and said that there were people saying, hey, uh, you look just like Mark McGrath and blah, blah, blah. <laughs> and it's just, you know, it's a curse being this beautiful. I'm flattered, by the way. Well, so am I. I was always, it's a curse being this beautiful. But, uh, you know, uh, I, it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's flattering to me, bro. And I'm just a fan of yours. And Thank I, you, I'm brother. really glad to get a chance to sit down with you, man. Appreciate you having me. Definitely. We're here to dispel any rumors. We are not the same person. We are in the same room <laughs> right now. Everybody at home, we are not the same person. Well, take it back to the beginning for me. There's so much to get into. You have so many great stories, by the way. I love all your stories. But Thank take you. me back to the beginning. You grew up in Connecticut and moved to LA, I think, when you were eight years old. And at some point, I think there was like a Michael J the Jackson Five were what kind of got you into music early on, right? Yes. And, and I, you've done some research, Scott. Well done. <laughs> uh, you know, I grew I was born in Connecticut. And then I moved out when I was eight years old to uh, Orange County, Newport Beach in particular. So I feel for all intents and purposes, I was raised in Southern California. And Southern California in the uh, late 70s, early 80s, there was a radio station called K-Rock. Of course. Still here, but fed all of us with this incredible new wave and uh, new romantic bands, punk bands, post-punk bands, Gang of Four type bands. There really was our staple that we grew up on. And like, I always call it the K-Rock phenomenon because if you meet people who are were raised outside of Southern California, they're not as familiar as what the Echo and the Bunnymen or Psychedelic Furs and what it means to people like us in LA or people that are raised in East Coast in New York in particular. So that was great to have that station. But I was just a fan of music. I loved music growing up. I fancied myself a rockabilly guy for a second. I was a mod for six months. I was a punk rocker until I found out the pit was too scary to be. In. <laughs> Still you know, is. This, well, you're right. But this is the days of the cuckoo's nest down in Orange County, like the hardcore when it was not, it was scary to be a punk rocker yeah. walking around with the uh, hair and just, if you had a damn shirt on, you would get harassed. I know it sounds incredible now, but that was really <laughs> how it was, especially down in Orange County back then with all the jocks and all that. Not to say that I was ever a real punk rocker. I was too afraid to that. It was just a little before my time, like the first wave of punk, the weirdos, the screamers, all that stuff coming out of LA. And of course, TSOL, Black Flag, Circle Jerks, the South Bay stuff was just a little bit before I was ready to take a dive into that pond, you know? And then hip hop, I was a break dancer as well. So all these genres of music kind of influence how I would become a songwriter. Now, this was never the plan to be in a band growing up. I just loved music. And I remember the first single I ever got in my life, and I'm gonna date myself here, but on the back of an Alphabet cereal box, you could cut out the Jackson 5 45 single called ABC. Get it, alphabets, yeah, A, yeah. B, C. I'm never thinking back <laughs> in the 70s. And so I had this crappy thing I put on my mom's turntable, and it was probably the first single that I fell in love with. You know what I mean? And it was the Jacksons, and they, were, they had a cartoon on at the time. So that was me going, mm, this music thing's kind of rad. You know, it really it really touched a nerve on me and it had an emotional effect that like, I still have to this day, I still love music, still love hearing new stuff. So my problem was, is that I love music. Um, I used to take a tennis racket and play in front of the mirror and act like I was in Kiss or The Knack or whatever band I was into at the time, but I had no talent. You know, I had three major things going against me when I wanted to be in a band. Couldn't write a song, couldn't play an instrument and couldn't sing. Three small obstacles on your way to a musical <laughs> career, you know. Uh, but Oddly you, enough, 30 years later, we're sitting here, right? Well, it's, that's that's the yeah. glory of life and, you know, taking chances and following your dreams. Yeah. I always say to people, you know that little dream you have in the back of your head that you can't even tell your friends? 
Follow that one. Yeah. Follow, that's your real passion right there. I don't care how stupid it is. You want to own the Lakers, go get it. You know what I mean? You can, you, this, is the, this is the dream. I'm living proof of dreams can happen. So there was a band in my high school, kind of step a little bit forward, uh, called the Tories. And they were the cool guys in the uh, high school. Um, they were kind of a mod, psychedelic band, jam, Creedence Kill, Career Water, uh, uh, Beatles type stuff. This and, is like mid eighties, by the yeah, way. Yeah, this too, is right? yeah, this is going to be like eighty two, eighty six, my high school years. But what's interesting is, you know, one of the guy, two of the guys became members of Sugar Ray, okay. Um, and so they were real altruistic sixties mods. They wouldn't play anything outside that, and they played all the cool parties. Now I was not a cool guy in high school, believe it or not. Can you imagine that? So I figured out early that if I carry their equipment. I could get into the parties. And I was considered kind of cool just by my proximity proximity to the band. So I did that for a while. And, you know, the 86, 87 came in, Guns N' Roses with Colin, Faster Pussycat, LA Guns, all this cool kind of hair metal, if you will, from the late 80s that I loved then and I still love now unapologetically. You know, I love that music. By the way, my first band was with the singer of LA Guns. So that was the first band I was ever in, Paul Black. And we were, I think, because you were in the Shrinky Dings, yeah. which we'll get into. Yes, indeed. But my band, Black Cherry, Paul was in the Weirdos, That's which right, you mentioned. You were Black Cherry. And I so forgot. Black Cherry was, yeah, it was around that. It was Junkyard. It was, and, I, and again, just interesting enough, when I listened to the Shrinky Dings and I listened to your first single, it actually reminds me, you know, Caboose reminds me a little bit of Junkyard, weirdly enough, because, you know, you definitely veered into so many other musical territories. But that early single of yours kind of reminds me of that like mid late eighties junkyard stuff, which I guess you probably never heard that comparison, but do you remember junkyard? I haven't, but I am so honored by that because I love junkyard <laughs> yeah. and, and yeah, that was a band. You know, That's life in exactly. Hollywood. Yeah. Lord, I'm a simple man. You know, David Roach and yeah. what's great about junkyard and a lot of those uh, metal bands, uh, you know, rock and roll hair metal bands is that if they had a punk rock background, I usually liked you. Yeah. Guns and Roses exactly. with Duff, you know, and in his pedigree, uh, of course, you know, uh, Black Cherry, you know what I mean? Junkyard <laughs> with the big boys and all that. So like, you know, if you had a little tinge of punk rock in, in, in your get down, if you will, in the late 80s, I was going to be a fan of your band. So that's a huge compliment. We kind of looked at ourselves like this. Um, we were just a crappy, bad, faster pussycat back then. You know, just simple songs with just real banal, like elementary lyrics, banal, banal, whatever you want to uh I should, probably shouldn't use words I can't pronounce. Uh, you know, uh, and so that, that was, we we're very sophomoric in our lyrical approach and our musical approach. We just weren't good enough then to get a record deal in the late 80s. We were in our 20s, 21. It was interesting, there was a band called Razzle that became lit. Right, I remember. About Orange sure, County, yeah. Sure. And Black Cherry got on the cover of uh, Rock City News yeah, a few times, right? Yeah, Shrinking yeah. Inks was yeah. on there once, yeah. which was, if that was the only thing we ever did, shout out to Ruben Blue, yeah. that would have been a huge <laughs> accomplishment. You know what I'm saying? Well, all you know, these bands we were talking, because you mentioned we were, Bands like Orgy, right? So Jay was in, I forget what band he was in. Uh, Jay from Orgy was in another band well, before that. But all these bands. Well, Mir was in Rough Cut. Right, exactly. I yeah. mean, come on. Yeah. Well, well, I mean, <laughs> yeah. that's huge. Right, well, exactly. you know, So with Mark Ferrari and Rough Cut, that's huge. So so how do you go from break dancing yeah. and early, like, you know, in your mid-teens to obviously the shrinking things? How did that happen yeah, for so you? Yeah, so I was kind of, sorry, I get real tangential <laughs> and go on long, sort of boring. Just if, when I see your eyes glaze over, I'll, I'll snap out of it. Um, you know, as I was mentioning, Span the Tories was, was the hot band in high school. 86, 87, 88 comes in. It's getting a little more rock and metal. Now, the lead singer of this band, the Tories, had wanted nothing to do with this hair metal. He thought it was blasphemy to his whole, you know, his, his, his commitment to music and the 60s and 70s ethic, if you will. And the other guys are kind of going, let's spread out a little bit. You know, we've done this for four or five years, and we've kind of plateaued to where we're going to be. And so they were, they were at a pool party once, and I'm roading, you know, with my rat, like, ripped up T-shirt <laughs> on, like, long hair, bandana, you know, rocking out like this shirt off when I could take my shirt off. Uh, <laughs> and one of the band members goes, let's play some Back in Black. Come on, dude, it's ACDC, it's close enough to that. And the singer puts guitar down and said, I'm not doing it. Someone else picked up the guitar and I sang Back in Black at a pool party, sang the song, and at the end I flipped into a pool. It was Newport Beach at like one of those rich guy backyard <laughs> pool. The parents were in Europe for the summer, so he took it over. And I don't wanna say they were impressed by my performance, but it was memorable. You know what I mean? And they, they go, hmm, there's something there. Consequently, they broke up six months later, and the two guys that I mentioned, Rodney and Stan, the drummer and the bass player, uh, Asked me if I wanted to join a band. We incorporated this guy, Murphy, from Irvine, who's another like old school kind of punk rock dude. He grew up with Zach and all those guys from Rage Against the Machine. Um, and 
We started the Shrinkin' Inks in July of 1988. We started the Shrinkin' Inks. That band got signed as the Shrinkin' Inks, but had to change her name to Sugar Ray uh, when her first record came out. So that's how I got kind of where the band started and why I'm talking to you pretty much. But it was the height of hair metal in 88. So, Beyond. So it was, There you was know. no other choice. Yeah. You didn't go like, hey, I'm going to be like, you know, college, the REM was really college REM back then. Sure. You know, uh, Jane's Addiction was coming along to let us know what alternative music was going to be. And this was pre-Nirvana and all that. Jane's was only doing the thing that was like, wow, there's something else atmospheric and really some like mo uh, melding of punk rock and, and, and a classic rock and roll without selling out to the hair metal spandex <laughs> bandana thing like we were all doing. You know, they kept it really real and basically paved the way to what alternative music would be in the 90s. They don't get enough credit. I mean, they do, but they don't. Yeah, definitely. You know, Smashing Pumpkins were kind of doing it out there in Chicago too. So there was a real kind of thing that was, uh, that was bustling underground. Not to mention we were a part of that. You know, there's some other, you know, very serendipitous actions that had to come about for us to happen. Sublime being part of that, which you can get into. But that led us to being, I mean, basically, the, Nirvana came out in 91, right? And a lot of people like to say, Nirvana didn't kill hair metal. metal. Hair metal killed hair. No, they didn't. Nirvana, I can show you the date when that record came out. <laughs> there was literally a time when I talked to Stevie Rochelle from Tough. I, I don't know if you're familiar of, with him. Of course. Yeah, I he's mean, just a legend, fun guy. We can do a whole episode about we hair could. metal. <laughs> and, and so could he. He's a great, <laughs> yeah. he's, he's really, he never partied or anything. So he's got a wonderful, he's like a historian yeah. of, of that time. But he will tell you on a Friday, it was Guns N' Roses uh, on, on MTV. It was Guns N' Roses, uh, Metallica, and Tough at number three. That Monday, it was Nirvana at number one and slowly kicked every band off. Literally, he had the smallest cup of coffee, Tough, ever. So they just changed it overnight, and the labels didn't know what happened with Nirvana. No one predicted it. It came out of nowhere, as we all know. But what happened and why bands like us got signed is labels were so terrified, they just threw everything against the wall. If you didn't know how to play solos, you can barely write a song, and you had a Marshall and a Les Paul, you, were, you were getting signed. Yeah. And I'm not kidding you, that's how it was, and luckily we got wrapped up in the Nirvana phenomenon that we sound nothing like them. That's the reason why we got signed to Atlantic Records. Although the story about how you got your deal is pretty incredible. So you, you do this video with Mick G, yeah. and you end up putting it into a pizza box, and tell that story, it's an incredible story, and also the story about Rick Rubin calling you eventually and his team. Yeah, it's a great, it's a great yeah. story. Okay, now as I mentioned, like Nirvana kind of put down all of the pretension of music, kind of like the Sex Pistols did in the 70s with, you know, if you were in Yes or the Eagles and the Pistols come along, it was direct, direct reaction to that. So it, it basically opened the door for bands like us to get looked at. Now what we did is our, my best friend, Mick G, I've known him for 50 years, still my best friend, we see him tonight for dinner. And by the way, I recommend everybody have a long-term best friend. It's the most valuable thing you'll own besides your family, I promised you. Definitely. Now, getting off that a little bit, McGee said, you know, you got your guys' music sucks. It sucks, you know, and, and we knew it did. We had two original songs. One was called Caboose, and one was called Lick Me. And Caboose <laughs> was the junkyard song you're sounding like, and it was the least offensive title. So we said, we'll take that one to, like, send to the labels. But McGee goes, your music, it, it, it's not going to get a deal. It's going to sit on a, a you know, cassette recorder in some A&R guy's office. No one's ever going to hear it. What your thing is, is visual. We were like, we were like a fun time band from Newport Beach that started this band to play covers, Judas Priest, Zodiac Mind Warp, Motorhead, Run DMC. That's what we did, strictly for fun. He goes, maintain that same ethos in a video. And McGee was starting to come into his own in terms of his, his visual thing. He became a big director, Charlie's Angels, uh, Terminator, uh, tons of, of TV you've seen, Chuck, The O.C. And so it was a perfect timing of a best friend that was willing to rob Peter to pay Paul to max out his credit cards <laughs> to make a video on 35 millimeter film. So now we went from like throwing a, a, ta uh, a, a cassette tape to people no one's ever going to hear to this incredible video sh cut with really quick edits that would become the future of MTV videos because McGee did every video you saw Smash Mouth, Corn, Offspring, Ours, I mean, Everclear, the list goes on and on and on. Um, so it was a perfect timing for us to get McGee to do our video. And then we said, you know, we've got this great video, but still, we got to get someone to watch it. So we said, you know what, why don't we put the video in a pizza box and send it to every Every listing, every name we can get a hold of, whether it's a publicist, a management, record label, God knows what, let's throw it out there. So we make, we get all these pizza boxes, and it's not expensive to put 500 pizza boxes <laughs> right. together, you know, and 500 cassettes. I mean, it's a couple thousand dollars, which might as well have been a zillion dollars to us back then. We figured it out, did a little Rob paying Peter, a little bit of begging, a little bit of girlfriends kicked in, thank you ladies. <laughs> uh, and then we were lucky to put this thing out. So the first couple days, nothing rang, didn't get anything back, I'm like, well, we gave it a shot. About four days later, we get a call from Rick Rubin's office. 
Now, this is insane because Rick Rubin was the goal. Of course. Because, you know, deaf American at the time, you know, it was like Black Crows. It was Slayer. The Four Horsemen, the, the Four Cults. Horse, but the, the, exactly. Yeah. Nobody said it was easy. <laughs> I love the Four Horsemen, man. God, shout out to Frank. Rest in peace. Um, but we, we thought like, you know, if we could just go to hold on Rick Rubin, he's going to realize our genius because we're the same person, Rick Rubin and I, yeah. meaning the band and McG. So he did. His team calls. He goes, Rick wants to talk to you. We go, oh, my God. Oh my God. This is it. We're doing a we phone hit the call. Big time. This is it, you guys. This is our deal. Let's go buy some Ferraris right now. It's happening. So Rick calls us and goes, Hey guys. And we're all gathered around like a speaker phone. You know, we're all excited, nervous to say anything. And he goes, I just want to say that was an ingenious idea what you guys did there uh, with the pizza box. It got to me. I looked at it. He goes, That the kind of minds I like, the kind of minds I want to work with. We're like, It's for in. We're so <laughs> stoked. Deaf American. I can see the logo, the label. I'm like, We're in. We're best friends with the, you know, with with uh, Rich and Paul and everybody from the Black Crowd. <laughs> we're, we're done. We're done. This is a formality getting out of the contract. He goes, yeah, I really loved it. I didn't think much of the songs, though, but I think you guys could be really good as part of our uh, our street team here at American. We're dropping the death. <laughs> we want to be American. We'd love to have you aboard. And it went from the greatest phone call in the world to, like, the most crushing, pulverizing dream at the same time. Our show today is brought to you by the fine folks at Sonos. I have to take a moment to talk to you about my favorite speakers on the planet First impressions, open up the box, some of the sleekest speakers I've ever seen in my life. Sonos has hands down been my favorite speaker brand for years, especially as a touring musician myself. I've used all types of speakers throughout my career, and I gotta tell you, Sonos beats them all for sound quality and ease of use. I recently got the Beam Sound Bar and the extra subwoofer, plugged it in, super easy to use, and I gotta tell you, my room fills up with sound like no one's business. The Beam Sound Bar is the clearest dialog, such insane bass, especially when hooked up to my extra subwoofer. My homeroom shakes. It literally fills up my bed with so much sound. Lately, I've also been using the Arc sound bar for my living room TV. It's super easy to connect to. I was able to seamlessly hook it up. It's sleek and it blends right into my space. The Arc sound bar has really changed the way that I watch TV and movies. I'll have some friends over, I'll hook it up to the extra subwoofer, and it really helps to create that intense surround sound. The design's immaculate. It looks great below my TV in my living room. And my favorite thing about Sonos speakers is how easy they are to use. You can set them up in under 20 minutes or so. The sound's incredible, they look incredible, and they are the best gift you can buy for anyone. Head over to Sonos.com to learn more and find gifts for every listener on your list. You were quitting your day jobs. We were done. <laughs> Scott, we were done. It was over. We were in our matches. We were going to go, we're going to hang with the Chili Peppers recording the next Blood Sugar Sex match. It was over for us, man. And little I didn't know how really over it actually was. And I thought, well, maybe we should do that. Maybe we're a street team. And McGee and the rest of the guys, we're, we're, we're a band. We got this. Look, we got to Rick. There's something here. So as crushing as that was, a little bit inspiring as well, knowing that someone like Rick's caliber or his office's caliber could reach out to us. So we kept going. And a management team out of New York about a month later got a hold of the video. Uh, there was an uh, A&R guy who saw it uh, named Nick Castanelli, who took the train in with these guys who were part of a uh, like an entertainment group. They weren't actually managers yet. They were doing um, corporate parties and things like that. You know, they knew a few people. So it got into them. They loved the video. They loved it. We go, we're going to ride with this. This is this is something we uh, you know, we were looking for this. So with the help of Nick Castanelli, who was Atlantic Records at the time, and our guy Lee Hyman and uh, Chip Quigley, uh, got the uh, tape to God's hands, basically, which was Doug Morris at Atlantic Records. He got the video. And at okay. that point, you only had like two songs. I, I am I am not kidding <laughs> you when I say we had two songs. I, I'm not. I mean, it's, it's it's part of the most it's the most incredible story ever because you could lie then, Scott. You can't lie now. Everything's online. You know, we said we got a thousand songs. We're gigantic in San Diego because in '94 in San Diego there was like a Cargo Records. Uh, sort of, uh, what was the name of that club down there? Everybody's playing it. It's Casbah. Casbah, yeah. Casbah, exactly. Yeah. And it was, you know, Drive Like Jehu, uh, Deadbolt, Rocket from the Crypt. Like, yeah. well, you know, we're, we're just like them. We're, we're, <laughs> we're on the same thing. And so, like. Later on, STP. Exactly. STP, yeah. too, as well. Yeah. So there was a huge, and we did, we played a lot in San Diego. And anyway, I'm getting ahead of myself. But um, so it gets to Doug Morris Atlantic Records. He watches the video and goes, I love this. 
I don't care what it is, sign it immediately, get these guys in my office, I wanna sign these guys. And he was the president of Atlantic Records at the time. So we didn't have an a and guy. Our a and guy was the president of Atlantic Records. He goes, sign them, I'm passing it down. Normally you go up right, to the president. Of course. He goes, so by the grace of God, we got to Doug Morris's hands, and he goes, sign this band, I don't care what it costs, this band is the reason why I got into music. Because you gotta understand, 94, 93 is all about anger and grudge, and we were losing people, and you know there was very much not a like fun time, good guy, <laughs> you know, not good guy, but a fun time rock and roll band, and that's what we were at the time, and that's how we got signed, bro. But uh, crazy enough, I mean, no bands were getting record deals, guaranteed two records with two songs for a million so, dollars too. So a you million kind of, bucks. Yeah, so I was here to tell the story. You kind of bamboozled Atlantic in a way to giving you a deal because at some point when you worried, we only have these two songs. Beyond beyond right. word, I thought they figured out, and they by, by the way, we also got signed out of New York. We were a West Coast band. I mean, we did everything backwards and wrong. That's kind of been the story of this band. But again, Scott, like there was, you know, we were, there was 3,000 miles, you know, kind of buffering us between New York and LA so we could lie. And by the way, the Atlantic Records people decided to do a little bit of research on Sugar Ray, okay? So with the shrinkings at the time, we weren't even Sugar Ray then. Um, and they happened to call one record store, like an independent record store in San Diego, and buy Again, the most serendipitous piece of luck. <laughs> the kid answered the phone, I'd seen this a few times out at Mission Beach. There was a place called Chillers down there that everybody from San Diego State would go there and just party. And we had we had a little bit of a following and people knew us a little bit there, but not enough for someone to call a record store. And the guy that answers goes, yeah, I know that band. The guy that answered knew, knew the Shrinkin' Inks and loved us and loved us, man. And so this band's so great, they're gonna be huge and blah, blah, blah. So that was the one little affirmation we got objectively that led to this million dollar record deal with Atlantic Records, man. I still laugh and smile about it because <laughs> I just wish that was still possible today. Definitely. Because we're missing bands that maybe just didn't have it all conventionally what it meant to be a signed band. And you're missing those bands that just like, I don't know if there was something there that just wasn't getting developed or wasn't a conventional signing and got signed. And that was us. And those early shows Shows of the shrinkings were almost like performance art with you. It's so you were doing your like best Iggy Pop at that point, right? You were cutting yourself a little bit, and it was crazy because you're obviously the music transformed and changed a lot. But taking a deep dive into those early shows, it's great to see what you guys were doing back then. There's a, a heavy punk influence on the band. Oh, uh, without a doubt, and performance yeah. art's probably the best way to put it. You know, we had a couple songs. We throw in a bunch of covers like Wango Tango by, <laughs> by White Minority by Black Flag. Just all these pretty crazy. Uh, it's Tricky by Run DMC. And what we do is they'd carry me in from across from the back of the venue. I don't know if you ever saw that. So we and so many times we almost got like busted by the cops because we have this like wooden cross in the back of our truck, and we're taking it up to L.A. from Newport Beach, we got pulled over a few times. Like, what are you doing with a wooden cross in the back of your truck? So they, they literally like tie me to it and and just run me through the crowd. And all of a sudden you're looking behind you and this guy's on a cross being taken. It was just all this showbiz stuff. And so I would like l light my stomach open. I'd see Iggy Pop doing that old performance stuff from the 70s when he put peanut butter all over Stage and sliced his stomach at the, I think at Rodney's English Disco down there, he did yeah. that. And what's great is you do really like just topical scratches, it looks way worse than it is, you know? It's like, why Gigi Allen's over here? It's all this stupid stuff that I'd seen people that I really admire do, because I didn't know what else to do. I wasn't the most creative guy. Again, didn't have much talent, but I just wanted this so badly. I wanted to be in a band, a working band, a band that got signed. That meant everything to me. Getting signed to Atlantic Records with their pedigree and provenance, if you will, was like, I still look back and go, you know, Aretha Franklin, the Rascals, you know, Zeppelin, Stones, you know, Skid Row, come on, dude, all these killer <laughs> bands. And then I'm just so grateful to be part of it. And I'll go back a little bit, you know, they, they did a 40 years of Atlantic Records history of it, and we're in that book. And Amazing. I got a signed, uh, my signed copy from Ahmet Erdogan that says, thank you for being a part of our rich history, Ahmet Erdogan. Amazing. I mean, dude, I look at it every now, every now and then <laughs> myself and just have a beer and go, that was crazy. <laughs> so yeah, so we, so those were the early uh, shows by, by Sugar Ray, very performance art. You know, I remember Dave Quackenbush from the Vandals, shout out to the Vandals, love the Vandals. Josh Freeze, member of the uh, Vandals yeah. and the Foo Fighters now. He was an early, might, might have been the first fan we've ever had as the Shrinkin' Inks. We used to play in this place called Night Moves down in Orange County. Sure. It became 5902 after that. You probably played there yeah, a few times yeah, back in the Black Cherry days. <laughs> yeah. or, uh, filthy McNasty and Black Cherry, <laughs> one night only. I love uh, that you remember all that. Oh, uh, it was such great times. <laughs> uh, seriously, some of the best times in the world. Yeah. But I remember Dave Quackenbush, and I'm like, because I was a huge Vandals fan. I loved Dave. I thought Dave was kind of our king ad rock. He was super cool. He, did, he looked cool. His style was cool. All this 
stage mannerisms were just effortlessly cool. And he was kind of the king ad rock. And he said, I go, dude, why, why, what, what do you like about her man? He goes, I can't tell if you're the worst band in the world or the best band in the world. I go, that's the biggest compliment I've ever had in my life. And I go, okay, we're doing something. This is like 89, we first started too. So, so you, get, was, you have these two songs, by the way, and you get this record done. And at that point, you're thinking, what are we going to do? We got to write some songs. We got to get in the studio and make this happen. Because yep. you, did, you didn't really have a back catalog. You hadn't been writing songs for years to pick from at that point. Well, we were working on our sophomore record on our first record. You know what I mean? We didn't have this wealth of material that we'd built up. Uh, luckily, we got together with DJ Lethal from House of Pain. Now, he was going to produce the first record because I was a huge fan of Jump Around. Jump around, jump up, jump up. And I love that song. I go, oh my God, House of Pain, jump around. We're hanging with DJ Lethal. We're going to make it again. <laughs> and then we get, we uh, sign up for him to produce us this wonderful deal. He's going to get points in the record, a nice little chunk of dough. I'm going to record up at his house up here in the Hollywood Hills. And then I kind of find out, like a couple weeks later, he didn't produce Jump Around. <laughs> DJ Muggs produced Jump Around. Uh, but but he's still doing your record. Yeah, but it ended up being, well, yeah, but we were all, and I, I really like Lethal. I still do. It's a good cat, a little solid guy, and super creative. He gave us these wonderful loops that we had no idea what to do with. There was no playing on them. They were sort of like these prices, right? Like sags being between games, like do, 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 like jazzy things. And like Rodney and I, a guitar player, we're still a guitar player, just came up with these dumb little medleys and stuff. And then we started going, okay, we got these little weird vibe songs. Let's name them like funny titles. And one was called Danzig Needs a Hug. You know what I mean? All these. <laughs> did he ever hear it, by the way? Yes, he did. <laughs> and uh, and, and he's, he gave the perfect response. Someone asked him, hey, uh, Glenn, have you heard, it was an interview, have you heard the, uh, that song by Sugar Ray called Danzig Needs a Hug? And he goes, Sugar Ray can suck my dick. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, we put that in the loop. And like, we did that as an opening for our concerts forever. We, we got to go back to that. It was so perfect. Such the most, this is why Dancing Needs a Hug was the title, because of that response. So it was perfect. Um, and then we just did all a bunch of like vibe tracks. And, you know, it became our day job. So we got a little bit better at, at writing music and just put some thrashy, punk rocky, sort of pre. Uh, rap rock songs, you know, we we have a huge fan of Rage, Rage Against the Machine, so I was trying to figure that out. There was a band out of New York called Shooty's Groove that I loved a lot. They were doing a little something like this. Lords of Brooklyn was on the, you know, on the yeah. peripherals. So I'd heard about them, had a demo tape. So we're trying to rap rock a little bit, but I am the worst rapper <laughs> ever. I've got zero timing and my lyrics are just like, didn't get a BMW until I was 18. <laughs> my dad hates me. And I just, I didn't know what to do. So I, I was using that a little bit, more like in a Henry Rollins style than less like rappy style. You know, and we just came with this record that ended up being kind of fun. It's very rap rocky, thrashy rocky. It's a lot of people's favorite record if you're a Sugar Ray fan. How do you personally feel about the record when you think back on it and you reflect I love on it, it because it's kids in a candy store. Yeah. You know, this is people working on their dream. You know, careful what you ask for. We had a lockout studio. Just make a record. You know, always want to, you, know, you always think, if I could just get a label deal and have a lockout studio, I'd be so creative. It's not, it doesn't work out that way. There's parting to be done out in the yeah. city too, Scott, you know, as you know, and I was one to make sure every beer was drank <laughs> in the club. Uh, and, and so it was just, you know, it, it was super fun. And we got to travel the world on that. We did seven tours of Europe on that Lemonade and Brownies. That was the name of our first record to let you know of our, you know, lyrical content and, <laughs> and, and, and subject matter. We did seven tours of that uh, Lemonade and Brownies and from 95 to 96. We did one tour with Corn and Lords of Brooklyn in the United States. That has completely flipped since then, <laughs> but that was where we were. And you know, the Deftones had come out then, and over there in Europe, rap rock was considered totally cool. There was a band called Doggy Dog that was killing it over there. They were getting MTV awards, and you know, they, they were really cool. They kind of, we when the Sex Pistols reunited in 96, we got to be part of that tour. It was Doggy Dog, Sex Pistols, Cypress Hill, sure. Sisters of Mercy. Yeah. Just, I mean, we, we thought we really made it there, because I love the Sex Pistols. If I can be honest with you, Sex Pistols is the reason why I ever had the balls to get on stage. I mean, I named my son Leiden for Christ's sake. That's so how much they, they mean to me. So we had a little s momentum going on. There was something happening there, Scott, but I don't know if it was enough to make a second record. And there's a pivotal moment here where you end up doing something for Stern, and that's kind of what changed sort of the trajectory of the band at that point for you, right? Because Howard Stern, I guess he's sort of I guess you would credit him for a lot of the success of the band at this point, right? Absolutely, without a doubt. I mean, Howard Stern loves to take credit for everything. <laughs> he can absolutely take credit for the success of Sugar Ray, getting to make a second record. Because you were getting some momentum in Europe, but here in the States, it wasn't really happening for you yet. That's exactly right. There was minimal interest in the States. Uh, we, we got on... Um, 
uh, you know, Beavis and Butthead, and we we got a little bit of got to play live on uh, uh, MTV's 120, but just nothing was really just sort of cracking. We weren't making a dent. We probably had sold 35,000 records, which at a major label with a million dollar investment was not what they were looking for. Now we were on a tour. I'll never forget this. Um, it was by ourselves, and I think it was with the Toadies, believe it or not. Remember? Good band, Toad, yeah. yeah. So <laughs> help me, Jesus. The best, man. I love <laughs> that band. Um, really good guys. Shout out to Vader. Um, and uh, so that was a fun tour, which is really fun about that. Their song, Possum Kingdom, was hitting during that tour. <laughs> and so we really got off the tour playing in front of 10 people with them. And then three weeks later, I saw them at the forum opening for the Red Hot Chili Peppers. So I kind of saw this could kind of happen if you just get a song. You got to have a song. I used to f- fool myself, Scott, that with a little bit of showbiz and the right hairdo, you could fool people and you can show them some voodoo and smoke and mirrors and they wouldn't worry about a song. There's never been a career that hasn't been defined on a song. That, And I'm talking about a pop career or a career that's really hit the charts. Yes, there's been certain subgenres of people that have had careers and that's great, but that wasn't what I was looking for. You know, I wanted MTV, number one, gold records, I wanted it all. Um, and so I, we, I think during the making of Lemony Brownies, we had some songs, but they weren't hits. And I think we knew that before it was even released. And even, I remember Jason Flom, who was working at Atlantic at the sure, time. Sure, known well. Yeah, great guy. Love Jason. Uh, he goes, you guys don't have a hit here. I know you don't. And I go, I will kill for this record. I'll do whatever it takes for this record. And he goes, all right, you don't have a hit. I know a hit. I don't see a hit. You know Jason. Yeah. And so, uh, but, you know, to his credit, he let us a- actually release the record. And there was another Jason Flom story I'll get to after the, the Howard Stern story. So we're on this really depressing tour with the Toadies, again, opening in front of eight people. And the record had kind of run its course about a year now out. So you could see the writings on the wall. This was not happening. A little bit of noise in, in Europe, but not enough to get anybody excited over here. Um, and then... You know, Howard Stern was always saying, like, I don't know why some of these bands don't record my songs, the number one songs, these songs I did when I was 12. And if you listen to them, they're, they're awful and unlistenable, like, you know, they will be, he's like, I got this voice that's not his. <laughs> he's eight or 12, whatever he was, singing these songs. And he goes, you know, the Meat Puppets are supposed to do one of my songs. And the Meat, meat Puppets were huge then, you know, with uh, Backwater. Yeah, and that, that was just, they were huge. But for whatever reason, they couldn't get together to record the song. I know the reason why, but I'm not going to say. <laughs> uh, and so we said, you know what? We had, there was a metal guy working at Atlanta called John Nardichone. He was a huge Stern fan, like we all were. And he goes, why don't you guys just take a shot and record the song? And I go, we don't have any money, bro. We're out in the middle of nowhere. What do you, what do you want us to do? He goes, why don't you go knock on a community college studio and see if they'll record you? Go on Burban and Atlantic Records, blah, blah, blah. And I go, that is the dumbest idea I've ever heard. Three hours later, we go to Denver City Community College, knock <laughs> on the studio and go, hi, we're a band, blah, 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 Atlantic Records. We had our CDs with them to show them. Can, can you guys record us for three hours? They did. We did a song called Psychedelic B, which was one of Howard Stern's two songs. He had Psychedelic B and Silver Nickels and Silver Dimes, which Jewel has ended up doing a cover of that. And like <laughs> everybody did it after us. We were the first, okay? Uh, we actually put Psychedelic B, the, the one we did, well, I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, which I'm toned to do. By the way, thanks for having me. This is fun talking about this. You can see I haven't thought about it in a while. Uh, so we, we stopped at Denver Community College, do this thing, and we fed X the song to our uh, manager, Chip, in New York. Now, back then, there was no cell phones. There was no internet, no email. So when you sent something, it was, a, it was like the Pony, Pony Express. <laughs> yeah, you took a couple days for it to lock on. So I remember uh, driving. We had forgotten about it. We drove about three more days, and we were in Wyoming now literally by ourselves. So the, we were playing tonight. And uh, I remember we, we drive up to the back of the venue and it's about 10 o'clock in the morning. And you know, when you're touring at that level, Scott, there's no one at the venue. It's you sit in the back of the van, you just do nothing with and just grind it out for eight hours before anybody gets there. You're starving, you got no money, blah, blah, blah. A lot of bands know the story I'm talking about. When we showed up, there was a guy with a beard flagging us down immediately, flagging us down. We're like, what does this maniac want? Long story short, he was the general manager of the club. He goes, call your manager in New York right now. He's got a, it's an emergency. You need to do it. Do you go know why? He goes, I know why, but I don't want to ruin the surprise. And I haven't heard the word surprise since we got signed. <laughs> you know, I go, can we use your phone, bro? We have no money, nothing. He goes, yes, I, I want you to know why this is happening. We call our manager. He goes, dude, Howard Stern has been playing your cover of Psychedelic B all day long. He wants you in the studio tomorrow to play it live. You got to do it now. Atlantic Records willing to pay for the flights and all that because Howard might get off on it. You got to come in Friday morning. 
We stopped everything, left all our crap in Wyoming, paid Peter to pay Paul. Atlantic wired us some money. We flew into New York that night, flew into New York at three in the morning, went straight to Howard, set it up, and then played Psychedelic B for Howard Stern. All the big higher ups at Atlantic Records came down to see Howard and all that, because Howard wouldn't let you in a studio just because you're a label guy. There had to be a reason. If you were trying to promote something or get over on Howard, he wouldn't let you in. So this was like, oh my God, Sugar Ray's done something? <laughs> so this brought all the big weeds from Atlantic out. We played on Howard Stern. It was great. We brought some girls there for him and all that. He loved it all. <laughs> one of the girls ended up marrying one of the guys on the crew, Scott, Scott Einzinger, <laughs> believe it or not. Uh, it was crazy, crazy, crazy. So it was a complete success. And we went from selling five copies a week, 18 copies a week, to that that following week it was 2,500 copies, which was a lot for us. Sure. Then it went to 3,000. So it built a little bit of a, a, a momentum where Jason Flom stepped in and said, listen, you know, I, I want you guys on my lava imprint on Atlantic. I'm gonna look after you, I'm gonna do whatever it takes. There's something happening here and I wanna be a part of it. So Jason was a huge, huge cog in the machine of getting the interest again uh, of Sugar Ray back in Atlantic and seeing this could be a possibility. So this is about 1997 or so. This right? is 96, yeah, this is not, 97 is when all it happened. So this was 1996, yeah. So 97, you start working on the second record, Floored, and it's an amazing story, the story behind Fly is that you actually heard the song, I think your drummer had sung it first, and you're like, I think I might quit the band over the song, it's so yeah. bad, yeah. which ended up selling two million records for you. That, the, the, what, the, the version of Fly that was to become ended up selling that much. The version of Fly I heard was just the chorus part, um, and it was like just on like a little like drum loop or something. And I was like, ha ha, I just want to fly. And I'm like, I quit. That's the worst thing I ever heard. And also because mind you, Scott, we'd open for the Deftones. We had a little bit of corn thing and that Adidas rap rocking thing. I thought it was our only path. And we certainly were building a little bit of a, a momentum in Europe because we've been on the cover of Kerrang! and Metal Hammer. So we had something to shoot for. And, you know, if they embrace you over in Europe, they embrace you forever. So I'm hearing this like, ooh, this like vibe track. It wasn't even, it wasn't even a song. And I remember calling McG. We were in New York City because we decided, uh, what a, we think it'd be a great idea to take four maniacs who drink way too much alcohol. Let's go record in the middle of the city um, and make a record and just give them an unlimited budget. And I remember Josh Abrahams was there working on Cold Chambers record. He came and visited <laughs> us. We stayed at the Penn Hotel, <laughs> just so much fun. Uh, what's up, Josh? I love that dude. And um, so it took a long time. We were making really heavy, heavy stuff. If you listen to the Florida record, the most of it is heavy. Fly is the anomaly on that record. Nothing else sounds like it. But I remember calling McG. I'm walking down the streets in New York, just so bummed out, going, dude, I'm quitting. I'm coming home. But this is what it is. And I wasn't that excited about the uh, other material to all, you know, full transparency. I go, if this is where we're going, I, I don't know. And he goes, dude, we going to come home here. What are you going to do? Go to Granville again? And, you know, come on, dude. I mean, you know, work it till talk. I mean, it's over. You come home, it is over. This dream that, like, I'm not saying it's going to happen, but at least you still got a shot. Don't you remove your shot. And he really talked me off the ledge. I go, okay. He goes, go look at it, see if you can do anything with it, add some verses, or do what you got to do. Because you didn't believe in the direction of the band at that point. No, yeah. I didn't think that was the direction. You got a, a falsetto, like, I just want to fly. And to me, the <laughs> lyrics content didn't seem a little... Like, didn't, you know, it didn't, you know, and this is our first kind of jump into an emotional song that meant something to anybody. So I go, okay, you're going to do that. I'm going to go write some verses. So I went and wrote all the verses to it and it started taking a little bit of shape. So much so that we sent it to D David Kahn. Now, David Kahn is a producer that's a world-class famous producer. Sublime. He, yeah, Sublime. But earlier he'd done um, Translator, you know, you're everywhere that I'm not, you know, he did a felony. I'm a fanatic. Ding, 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 ding. He also did a Walk Like an Egyptian. Sure. So the man knew how to craft a song. He just got off What I Got by Sublime. He just, and I, what, what I Got with Cracked in 96 in the spring. And we're like, God, that's such a great song. What a magical song. Sublime figured out how to, you know, integrate all the genres, the hip hop, the, the reggae, the rock, the classic rock acoustic. And not saying they were anywhere near Sublime, but we felt like there was something there because Sublime, we all look back at Sublime with rose tinted glasses. Now, if you were there uh, in Orange County and Long Beach in like the late 80s, 90s, if Sublime showed up to a concert, if they showed up to a show, most likely it would be a 60 minute dub jam. You know what I mean? <laughs> I, I, I didn't see where the genius was. I could see Brad had a great voice, but you know, I just saw, I just, there wasn't, 
People loved them then because 40 Ounce of Freedom was out and all that, and, and I get it. And, and I think Brad was like strung out at the time. He right? was, and like I said, half the time he wouldn't even show up. Yeah. They had date rape and stuff, and I thought that was okay, but that wasn't really my thing, you know? But when I heard what I got, my whole world exploded. And we're kind of sitting on fly. I'm not saying it's anywhere near the genius of a song that what I got was, but it felt like a simpatico to me. And David Kahn had done that. And Jason Flom got us connected with, with, with David Kahn. So David Kahn heard all the material, and then he gets to fly, at this point, I'd have my mother, God rest his soul, who edited those, those things. And he goes, I don't know about this other material, but that note you hit in the song, Fly, is it? Fly? When you go, my mother, God rest his soul, who, I think you can sell two million copies off that note right, right there. And I never heard a consumer uh, positive piece of, <laughs> of advice or affirmation, affirmation if yeah. you will, about anything we ever recorded or anything we ever like wrote. And coming from a guy who'd sold millions of records, had number one songs, I just got down on my knees. I go, we're, let's work with this dude, you know? Um, and so luckily, David Kahn came aboard. And he was the guy, Scott, that led us all to water. He said, look at, you know, this, you're going to do this, you're going to do that, you're not going to do this. He told me when I was recording Fly, I got some good news and some bad news. And I go, being an Irish guy, give me the bad news first, right? He goes, you can't sing. I go, I've heard that before. That's kind of the good news. He goes, but the good news is you have a tone in your voice. And it's your speaking voice that I think we can sell a lot of records in. So just listen to me, Pro Tools was just starting in the mid nineties. And David Kahn, because he's such a cerebral scientist, uh, Pro Tools was giving him prototypes to use. So he really could Frankenstein your, your voice and go, here's your voice. Pitch and pull, you know, uh, all, all that stuff. Um, and he really led me where my voice is gonna be, which led to Every Morning, Sunday, and all those songs. So that was, he was just instrumental in making uh, the Floored record happen. And uh, I, we owe a lot to David Kahn. I mean, he's just a huge part of any success of Sugar Ray. By the way, that goes on to become a gold record for you. What was it like sort of adjusting to rock star status at that point? Because before then with the Shrinky Dinks and obviously the first record, I wouldn't say you guys were rock star status. So, no. so what was it like for you after that record? Because it all started happening after that record for you. It did. Well, Josh Richman would play Mean Machine at Granville. So that was kind of exciting. <laughs> we thought we were big in Los Angeles. We love Josh. Yeah, he's the best. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, when that happened, it was interesting because there was a... Uh, a DJ at K-Rock who had heard Fly, I don't remember his name, it wasn't Stryker, it was a guy before him. Blonde hair, do you remember him? Not I forget, sure. he was yeah. watching, going, you jerk, <laughs> remember my name? But he, I remember I saw him at Swingers and he'd heard Fly, and this was like on a Thursday, and it was about to be released everywhere. He was, Mark, I promise you, this song, when it comes out, you will not be able to walk through the Beverly Center. I remember him saying that. I go, yeah, sure, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> so we released the song, got added everywhere. But when it got added to MTV, it got added to heavy rotation. So literally on a Friday, I could do anything. I could walk down the streets of New York. That Monday, I could not without being stopped and acknowledged. So, I mean, it was almost like a exact moment where we're like, no fame, fame. <laughs> You know what I mean? It was interesting. There was no, there was no casual transition. It literally exploded. And we were a little older, Scott. You know, when, when Fly happened, I was 27. I was not a young guy. And I'd seen a lot of bands go up the hill and come down. So I knew how precious it was. So um, I never really reveled in my own stink of how great it was. I always knew how fragile this could be. So I tried to respect it and protect it as much as I could. You but know? you went from eight people to arenas with Incubus and 311. So again, adjusting to that life, was that hard for you at that point? I mean, you know, there's always a learning curve to anything, especially like, you know, something that catastrophic and and, and life-changing, yeah. you know, and I was a guy, liked to have fun, liked to party, and I'm showing up the backstage, there's five cases of everything, three bottles of Jameson, six bottles, you know, and I never wanted to be disrespectful, so I had to make sure everything was drank before we left the city, but yeah, no, you you have to, it's, a, it's something you have to learn, and especially the road, you don't learn how to do the road, the road shows you how to do it, and so that's something we all thought was, uh, Oh, we're, we're tough. We can figure it out. No. I remember on the corn tour, they had a Jägermeister keg. Bad idea. Yeah. Put in for the first <laughs> week of that tour. Jonathan was pat. We were all pat. Barf. There was barf everywhere. I just remember barfing everywhere on that tour. And Peter Gatsis and Jeff Quantis goes, get that thing out of here, which was probably the best idea. So you have to figure things out and you push it. You push it too far. You make mistakes. You know, you figure out that your time isn't always your time anymore. If you want to be a band, people are excited to see you. 
You know, if you're fucking tired or whatever, that, that's on you, man. You know, you put a smile on people's faces and they'll remember forever. Be an asshole, they'll remember forever. I prefer to walk away with a smile on the face. And I learned, I learned from both doing both things. It's a great, great word to live by, by the way. So the third record, you become a commodity at that point because there's a lot of money in the line for the label. Yes. So the next record, 1459, an ode to Warhol's 15 Minutes of Fame. Talk to me about that record. Did you feel a lot of pressure with that record? knowing what you just come off of, Arena is a gold record? Well, it's interesting, you know, when you get a hit song, if you're lucky enough in the rarefied air to have a hit song, be a one-hit wonder. By the way, every band who doesn't have a hit wants to be a one-hit wonder. <laughs> right, sure. Somehow it becomes a bad term once you get there. <laughs> so we had our one hit. As I said, it was the anomaly on Florida. Nothing else sounded like it. We were the biggest candidates to be a one-hit wonder in the history of music. Not much talent, no, there was no song that sounded like anything else on that record. This has to be one off. They're not that talented. Didn't, you know, you know what I'm saying? There's nothing here. And I, I agreed with them, to be honest with you. I thought we'd be a one hit wonder too. It, David Connor producer had a lot to do with the success of that song, um, of, of Fly. So I felt the pressure. And when you get a hit, you get about a five, six months uh, shelf life. I mean, I just got there. And people are like, thanks for playing. Where's you know, the next you one? Just got here. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And you're just like, oh, can, can I get a year out of this maybe? So we Also, felt, not that easy to write a hit. Of course not. <laughs> and I tell everybody, I'll give you three chords, all the chords and the biggest hits in the world. D, C, G, go ahead, write me a hit right now. <laughs> Paul McCartney, God bless him, yeah. has a hard time writing a hit yeah. right now. The greatest songwriter of all time. True. And for some reason, songwriting is a young man's game too. It is. Yeah. There's not a lot of great... Uh, elderly songwriters, if I can be so just blunt, you know, it's, it's like kind of being an athlete, you know, you kind of hit your pace, then you're just chasing it the rest of your life. Um, so yeah, we felt the pressure for sure. Being a commodity, you know, we never had like Ahmed Ergen calling me at home going, how's, you, how's the recording going, Mark? you know what I mean? All that stuff. So we felt it. But and, Doug Morris might have been calling And you. Doug Morris as well. And they were saying, thank you. And this is great. And our Christmas presents got a lot better that year. I'll tell you that. <laughs> But we certainly felt the pressure. And I've always been very self-effacing to my band, to me. I always say no one makes fun of me or my band better than me. I'm the best at it. You know, prove me wrong, as I see the comments in this YouTube thing. <laughs> <laughs> but so, yeah, we felt the pressure. Uh, we were sitting on some songs that felt, the, felt pretty good. You know, I think Fly was kind of a fresh, new thing. And, you know, Sublime's What I Got was kind of new and fresh. And uh, unfortunately, we don't have the Sublime, so there wasn't more of that. And people were starving for Sublime songs like Bad Fish and uh, songs like that. So I felt we had, were sitting on some good songs. Like Every Morning felt good. We had David Kahn back in the fold. So we were hitting our peak as songwriters. We were at our absolute peak. There was three of us that wrote the majority of the songs, Stan, Rodney, and myself. And we were just firing on all cylinders. And plus with David Kahn's help. And he was really good at structuring and good at adding bridges. We'd bring a song 85 90% there. But that last 10% makes a hit song. Ask any songwriter. And so David was great at throwing that last 10% in. But still, even though I felt like we had some great songs, nothing is guaranteed. We, we, we did a pretty quick turnaround of the record because we wanted to make sure you know our name and uh, the sound was still fresh in, in people's minds. And I said, you know what? We couldn't think of a title. And I said, what about, we, we were at Chandara. Remember Chandara? Of course. We're eating there across from this old swing house yeah. in Coanga. Um, what's up, Phil? Remember Phil and Marco there? I was yeah. in a band with them. I didn't know that. Yeah. What, Sparrow or something? No, we were in a band called Automatic 7 back in the Automatic day. Automatic 7, band. Yeah, yeah, they were great. Were yeah. you guys on the Iggy Pop tribute? No, we, it was a punk band. We were together for like a year or so. But yeah, I was friends with Phil for many years. Yeah, so no, that's great. No, yeah. Phil was cool. Yeah. Uh, and so we're eating across the Chandar, and I go, ding. I go, I have the best. This is the worst idea or the best idea for, for uh, a, a title. And I told the guys in my band, I go, 1459. Like, I don't get it. I go, 14 minutes and 59 seconds, an ode to Andy Warhol's classic line, everybody will have their 15 minutes of fame in the future. But we have one second left, and this is our last <laughs> record. You know, this may be it. I go, if it's successful, it's the greatest record of, title of all time. If it fails, it's the greatest record title of, what do we have to lose? So they go, I don't know, a number of titles, it's confusing. I go, let's let David Kahn be the judge, because he was really just no bullshit guy. We went in a swing house, I'll never forget, I go, David, just, Free form, off the dome. What do you think of this? 14 minutes and 59 seconds. I didn't even tell him title for a record. He goes, he goes, what a class? He goes, it's the best title I've ever heard. <laughs> went back to the computer. <laughs> I go, I think that's it. So that was the title. And I remember there were, we, we, the record was done. And this was in uh, the winter of 98, fall of 98. And there was tastemakers in radio back then. There were either pluggers or people that, you know, consultants that gave their thoughts on songs. And Music Connection, the magazine, had one such gentleman. And we were going, we were going to release the single in, um, in January and the record uh, about three weeks after that. 
And um, I remember one of the guys, the tastemakers there, uh, and this was in, I think, November, like just in Thanksgiving, uh, Thanksgiving break. I remember reading Music Connection, and the guy at the bottom, it said, like, tastemakers on the bottom. It said, uh, I think I just heard the first number one of 1999, and you'll never believe who it's by, dot, 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 Sugar Ray. That moment, Scott, I got down on my knees and I started crying. I'm getting emotional thinking about it. I started crying. Because I'm like, oh, oh my God, we might do this. Again. You mean we might be here for a while? Much to people's chagrin, we might be here for a second. I, I, I'm getting misty thinking about it, dude. Like, oh my God, this might happen. And then a couple weeks later, we're getting all the feedback from Atlantic. They love it. It's going to explode, blah, blah, blah. They're going to play it 50 spins out the day, the first day in Texas and Miami. We're getting all these reports back. I'm like, oh my God, how could we possibly match this? Well, it did. Every morning went to number one. Video was everywhere. And then, you know, when you start becoming a band that's gonna stick around for a while, you know, that, that's good things. And then the record came out, sold 50,000 copies for 10 weeks in a row. Amazing. It sold the first, same amount it did 10 weeks later as the first week. Cause there was a little bit of buyer's remorse off Florida. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna <laughs> lie. Feel like I'm not gonna hoodwink us again with Lawn Song. So they had to wait a little bit to go, okay, there's a couple songs, we've heard it. You know, uh, stations were playing other songs like Falls Apart and Someday. And so they, I think people were hearing this, this is, this is a, a pretty decent record, you know? But we're so stupid again. We do a death metal song to start off the, the beginning of 1459. It's like, don't run with scissors, you know, be nice to your grandma. In a death metal, like, you know, Cookie Monster voice. Because we thought, would it be funny when everybody goes to like Tower Records and goes to those listening stations and they put on the first song and it's a death metal song and they don't buy the record? Wouldn't that be funny? That was our stupid mentality. Is this a Slayer record or I know, Sugar Ray that's record? What I'm that's what I'm saying. We thought it was like a funny thing and we'd get it, but in retrospect, I'm like, wait, we probably lost a couple of sales from that, you know, but we've never been the smartest guys in the world. So then it took off. And uh, uh, subsequently, uh, Everlast had What I Got, and he was having a big resurgence with that. We went on tour together. And I remember What I Got and, and Every Morning were just switching at one and two each week at Pop Radio. And that was just so exciting. Alternative Radio, mind you. That was just so exciting. That was such a fun tour. So in around 2000, 2001, at that point, this is your fourth record, The Strokes, Interpol. By the way, Paul Banks is the last guest on the show from Interpol. So I know. It's I funny know. how uh, Paul Banks to you, because there's a connection there. Yeah. So that all starts happening, the AAS, LCD, and you guys are on your fourth record. Are you thinking we need to change our sound to fit what's going on? Maybe not death, you know, death metal, or but at some point, we need to fit into what's going on in New York. And this is a scene that's obviously permeating music at this point. Yeah, definitely. It was going back to the, you know, the, the lo-fi rock and roll, you know, four guys in a garage type feeling, thrift shop clothes, great songs, you know, always great songs. It's always going to be part of it. And the writing was on the wall for bands in our fraternity. The Everclears, the Smash Mouths of the World, Third Eye Blinds. It was like, okay. And by the way, every five, six years, music turns out. We weren't done with our sound yet. We're like, we, we still got something here. <laughs> we just come off from a successful record. So we weren't looking to make a catastrophic change. But what I think we kind of did was go back a little bit. That was still to come on the next record. We were going to try, try a catastrophic change and evolves Pharrell on that that catastrophic change. So we said, you know, let's go back to a little rock and roll roots. You know, a rock and roll band. You know, we put out some pop songs with the acoustic stuff. Let's try and make a little rockier type record. And that became uh, the self-titled record, um, which had When It's Over on it. Now, When It's Over is very much in the family of Every Morning, Someday. We knew we had When It's Over in. And that to us was like, this song's good. It's a good song. It feels very similar. It has a simpatico to fly Every Morning, Someday. Sits nicely uh, amongst those three. So we felt we had something good. Let's experiment a little bit. Let's get back to more rock and roll stuff, the replacement stuff, the Rolling Stones kite stuff. Um, with our talent, though, trying to do those kind of bands. And here's the irony of the whole thing. The whole thing, and things come full circle. We went to Rick Rubin originally to produce this record. And I'm friends with Rick, and I've known him a long time now. And uh, good Pull, guy. He pulls on the beard when he's talking. Pulls on the beard. You know, uh, I think uh, when, when Nick was doing that, you know, uh, great, great dude. And I remember, like, doing... I remember being drunk and going to his house, and he goes, do you want to do some meditation, Mark? And I'm like, no, you know, if you're drunk. I, I was with my friend, G, and we were sitting there and doing meditation with Rick and going, hmm, hmm. And I go, I can't open my eyes. If I look at McGee, I know he's looking at me. <laughs> Rick's got his full, like, you know, just linen, white yoga bad boy on. And I go, don't look at me, G. Don't look at me. And I look at McGee with one eye. He's looking at me with one eye. We both, <laughs> and we're right under that gigantic white stuff. Polar bear he's got in his room. <laughs> Those who know, who know. So that was crazy. And this is when we're trying to tell him if he would listen to the music. And he, you got to go through a whole process with Rick. You don't sure. just sit down and listen to the music. It's it's yoga. It's it's pumpkin it's a philosophy. seeds. Yeah, it's a whole thing. And yeah. it's 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 a way of life for him. Yeah. He really lives it. And so 
he sat with the material for a while and he had when it's over in there and he goes, I don't hear a hit. I don't hear anything here. And I go, what do you suggest, Rick? And we just got, came off David Kahn, who's the most roll up your sleeves, get involved, task maker, taste, uh, task master, taste maker, show you what you're doing wrong, why that isn't good, have opinions type guy, to Rick just saying, I don't like that, do I like that? And that's how Rick works. And that works a very much a puffy type thing. I like that, I don't. It's like, you know, he's a taste maker. Sure. And we need people to more roll up their sleeves with that. He didn't like when it's over either. And I go, we, I, I know that's a hit. I, I, I feel good about that. So we ended up not uh, going with Rick. We always, it was something else in the back of our minds to like sort of connect all the dots with the Rick Rubin fantasy as we kind of <laughs> talked earlier, you know, just to get close to Rick and to work with them would have been a, yeah. you know, a real treat, but it wasn't in the cars. So we ended up going with Don, Don Gilmore, who just came off Hybrid Theory, a little record called Hybrid Theory by sure. Lincoln Park and Litz Record uh, with my own worst enemy and all that Ziploc and all that great stuff. So we felt like it would be a good guy to kind of Bring out a little rock and roll, a little pop punkiness more. And he did a great job and answer the phone and songs like that. So that was uh, the fourth titled record. Uh, that was our last record. It, it went platinum. It shipped platinum. Uh, they might have returned a few, so I think it says gold <laughs> in Wikipedia. But I've got a platinum record hanging in my That's house. That's all that matters. And it is platinum, god dang it. Uh, and so I think then, uh, Scott, after like the, the touring cycle of that, we went out with Uncle Clacker and had some really good tours. I think then we were like, okay, this, this is kind of going the other way now. We've had four or five, six years here and the Strokes are coming along, Interpol's coming along. Then on the next record, we said, we, we gotta make a change. We gotta do something different. We gotta reinvent ourselves. Around that time, you took a job at Extra, but the way that job happened, you kind of made it happen. You manifested it. Well, it was after it was after this, this last record. I'm talking. Yeah. This last record came out in 2003 when we said, you know, this is pretty much it. It's called In the Pursuit of Leisure. We reached out to Pharrell and the Neptunes to record <laughs> some stuff, and and they, and they gave us a song called Here It Comes, or Here She Comes, Here She Comes. And I wanted to write a record from the a song from the ground up with Pharrell, but you know, he was in his moment sure. in his whole thing. He had five different studios going on. He goes, no, this is your song. I can hear you doing it. He's a great salesman. We go, okay. So we did it and it just wasn't us. I'm like, this is a Neptune song. Maybe it's <laughs> us. It's gotta be great. And it's funny. So we, we just passed on it. We went about our own way and we're kind of feeling ourselves as songwriters at the time. We felt we had enough and it had been proven. You know, we'd, we'd been a commodity. And I remember a couple years later, I read an interview with Blink-182 and they go, yeah, we even worked with the Neptunes and Pharrell and they gave us a song called Here She Comes. And I go, oh my God, that was our song. So Pharrell was selling on that song somehow, <laughs> some way. So yeah, so then we did the, uh, the In the Pursuit of Leisure uh, record came out. That didn't sell anything. I think we ended up selling about 130,000 copies of that. Coming from a million selling, I mean, if that isn't the writing on the wall for sure. even the dumbest human being. <laughs> um, and, and so at that time, some of the guys in our band were having kids and they said, listen, we don't want to go in the immediate studio again. And our, our, let's be honest, our creative well had dried up. You know, we just... It, it didn't take a lot for me to go, okay, let me see what's around. And so- And sometimes uh, you need to take a break. You do, you do. And we, we did then, and music was changing, and we just were falling out of favor. You know, it's there's nothing more depressing than falling out of favor. Yeah. You know, I, I love to say <laughs> it. And we all take, you know, there's legacy bands that we all tried to be at that time. We, all of us wanted to be the Eagles and ACDC. And as crazy as that sounds, it's less crazier than saying, hey, I hope to have a hit someday as the Shrinking You know, so to me, it was like an attainable dreamer because I'm a Pisces, I'm a dreamer. Um, and I like to say Sugar Ray's legacy songs were not a legacy band. You know, the Stones are a legacy, Aerosmith, ACDC, sure. Coldplay, you know, Maroon 5. Those are legacy bands, you know. Uh, but we, we were fortunate to have some legacy songs. But that, the, the clock was ticking. It, it, it was over for us. And so there was someone at, 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 at Extra. I don't know what story you have, Scott. Um, but there was someone at Extra that called our manager a few times. And said, hey, I wanna, uh, her name was Lisa G. She said, I'd love to talk to Mark and get him in here. I think he'd be great in TV. And my manager knows, knew back then, I, I would never audition for anything. I, I, auditioning is like walk in and like this and like, all right, act. You know, I, I can't do it. I just, I cannot do it. So they go, just meet with this girl down there. And, and I go, okay, I'll meet with Lisa. I went down there. I talked to her. She's really fun. A Jersey girl, like, you know, just spitfire, super fun. She goes, you want to go on the, the, the uh, stage and see how it feels? I go, sure, I'll go on the stage. And I didn't care so much that I was great. I'm like, the stars were out in Hollywood last night. Let's take a look at Jerry and see what's going on up there in Sunset Boulevard. Take it away, Jerry Pentagon. I just didn't care. I didn't know what I was doing. And then ironically, um, they, they brought, um, oh man, I'm not, you know what's weird, Scott? I'm like the rock and roll trivia king. And as I'm getting older, my things aren't coming quick. Same. Aquaman, um, Jason Momoa. <laughs> 
God, it happens with start. age. It sucks, though. <laughs> yeah. I went to my doctor yesterday. I go, I'm losing my trivia skills. That's why I drink this, by the way. What is this? It's called Magic Mind. It's actually a productivity shot. It, it's like helps with mental alertness. Can I slam on it? Yeah, that? please. And so that's what I use. I, I drink this with my coffee every morning. And because we're getting older mm -hmm. and the brain needs to work a little quicker, this is what I use. So One more time. What's it called? Magic Mind. It's Magic great. mind. Magic yeah. mind. Thank you, man. <laughs> yeah. Oh, Jason Momoa. It's working. <laughs> no, but so Jason Momoa was on this thing called North Shore back then. He had short hair, looked like mine. And he was just hanging around. I'm like, why is this dude hanging around? It's bizarre. And they go, hey, Mark, do you want to talk to Jason for a second? And so they had me like fake interviewing Jason Momoa. I, I don't know. He knew it was an audition either. He was like, well, what's going on here? So I just didn't care enough that I was great. I was great at it. And I go, thanks for playing. I'll, maybe I'll do it someday. And that was it. They called my manager three days later and goes, would Mark like to co-host Extra? This was literally on a Friday, and then two weeks later, I am hosting Extra as you went to see from 2004 to 2008. I mean, it was another serendipitous, unplanned event, like most things that were uh, you know, iconic moments in my life were. And so I thank Lisa G for that. I loved working Extra. It was great. I mean, a lot of the entertainment news gets looked at as sort of fluffy, and it is. That's what the people want. But the people working behind the scenes at Extra Entertainment Tonight or whatever are some of the smartest people I've ever met. Because you go in there at 7 o'clock in the morning, and there's no show. They've got to make a show, and things are constantly changing, and stories are breaking, and really some of the smartest, most on it people I've ever met. And I was able to, to have some skills in my back pocket in my toolbox called hosting, which I do every now and then if, like, CNN has the best of the 90s show. Like, I <laughs> sometimes get the call, you know, so it's, it's a fun thing to be a part of. At some point, did you call your agent and say, I don't think I can do this, or did you have the confidence to go through with it? Well, you know, it, it, it interesting you say that. Uh, two, two things. First of all, the band never stopped playing. You know, that was part of my... Uh, one of my conditions of, of, of uh, signing on. I look at, I'm still going to be in the band. And, you know, when you work at those shows, they take about three months off a year. So there was a lot of time to kind of fill that and scratch that itch. But I would do shows on the weekend and stuff. So a, a lot of the misconceptions that Sugar Ray stopped there, never, we still were doing 50, 70 shows a year. Um, and we also put out a greatest hits record at that time with a couple new songs. Uh, but I remember it, two weeks into it, I was like, I can't do this. I go, I have to be there every day. I mean, every day. <laughs> it's I gotta a real job. I've got to commute. <laughs> and the craziest thing is, Scott, I'd have to drive by the Atlantic Records building <laughs> down the uh, down the the the, uh, the freeway over there, the 134, down in uh, that by, and just I was like, I'm Atlantic Records. I don't know if I should be doing this. So so much self doubt, and also I was super insecure about it, because hosting is very subtle. You know, I mean, Clint Eastwood made a career out of raising an eyebrow. You know, so it's very subtle. And I'm a bit of a spaz, as you can tell. And so on stage, I'm trying to hit the last thing, making big moves, you know, gigantic, you know, gesticulations and all that. And I didn't know what to do with my hands when I first got there. I'm used to holding a microphone. So they give me those like Carl's Jr. headset things or like they put a lava on you. So I'm going like, Jazz well, hands. welcome to Extra. I didn't know what to do. I'm going, All right, tonight we're going to Lindsay Lohan. I didn't know what to do. And then when you think you don't know what to do, you really know what to do. So yeah. I was very, I was just so insecure and... I remember talking to my, my agent, um, John Farreter, rest his soul. He's no longer with him. He was a musician. I'm not sure if you knew him. Um, and he was like, listen, Mark, we can get you out of this. It's going to be rough. There might be a little <laughs> bit of bumping, which is impossible to once you sign a contract. And plus, they invested so much money and time with mm. me and extra to get me there. He goes, why don't you just give it a couple more months? There's always some growing pains. And again, I'm glad to listen to smarter people than me. McGee, John Farreter, they're really like led me to like stick it out. And I did end up loving it after a while, really enjoying it. I loved my co-host, Dana Devon. She was fantastic. And everybody there was great to work with. The, my biggest sort of uh, affirmation, if you will, is I was down that 7-Eleven on Holloway and about six months into my uh, tenure, if you will, at Extra. And I walked into 7-Eleven there and it was like six in the morning. Now, when I would go into a 7-Eleven 6 in the morning, it was usually for other things. But, but at Extra, I was a good boy getting up early, and I was in there getting my coffee. And there was a sketchy dude in there, like a neck tattoo, when they were scary back in 2004 or whatever. And just got kind of dirty and stuff. And he's staring at me. And I go, oh, God. Like, not this interaction. You know, I'm just, it's too early. I don't want. And I get the coffee. I'm sitting there. And he goes, Mark, Mark. I go, oh, God, here we go. He goes, you're on that show that... Entertainment access. No one ever knew what to call it. No one ever does. And I go, yeah, yeah, man. He goes, you know, you sucked when you started, but you're getting good, man. Keep it up. And I go, oh my God, what is this real world I'm living in? So that was a bit of an affirmation and a kind of a cool thing. And I figured out that a lot of people watch these entertainment news shows and you, you think they do. So and you go on, apart. you go on to do Celebrity Apprentice. Yeah. You go on to do Big Brother. Did you like doing those shows? I did. You know, Celebrity Apprentice was hardcore because what was hard about it is you have to ask people for money. And they can't 
write it off in their taxes. Right. <laughs> so I called Jason Flom, the bastard. I called Flom. I go, Flom, I need 10 grand. Come down, make a pizza. You can say, hey, I work at Lava. He goes, Mark, I'm sorry. I'm separating from my wife right now. I go, I made you $80 million, bro. You can't give me 10 grand. And so there was, and, I, and I just, I'm so bad at asking people for things. Forget money. And so it was a little bit tough for me. Uh, but it was interesting to work with Trump and all that and their kids. And who, I would, who would have thought he would become president? Nobody. And not, <laughs> neither did he. Yeah. You know, he made that announcement just to increase his brand. I know it. Sure. I know the guy a little bit from spending some time with him. I spent eight hours in a room with Donald Trump, Gary Busey, and myself once. Just the three of us. <laughs> How was that? One of us became president. <laughs> that was surreal because he couldn't figure out Gary Trump. You yeah. know, he, he could not figure out because Gary's just a loose cannon. And Gary's like a little kid. He's really fun for like a half hour, 45 minutes. Then you want to give him back to mom. You know, then you've done all the point break dialogue. Hey, Utah, give me two. You know, and he'll do it right back. And then you're over it. And I love Gary, but he'll, he'll be taxing on your sanity after a while. So Celebrity Apprentice was hard because once you do one task, the next day you're calling your friends again. Hey, bro, can I get another five? You know, just to keep, it's really relentless. A lot of fun to do. And it was a big show. So it was, it was good to be on it. I think doing all these shows, Scott, was a way to let people know I'm still here. Sure. Much to your chagrin or not your chagrin. Uh, and it always led back to what the band is. That was always been home base for me. I've never deserted Sugar A. I've never quit the band. Uh, and always, always, I know where my bread is buttered. And I respect, the more I've been in the band, the longer I go away from success, the more I'm so grateful and respect what we did. So uh, it was always good to have, great to have that as the home base, you know. Well, fast forward to 2019, Little Yachty, the latest record. How'd yeah. you come up with the name? Well, Little Yachty was cracking at the time, you know, <laughs> and we were making a record that I felt had a lot of like yacht rock type songs. And I remember someone calling us a yacht rock band in the in the late 90s. It meant to be kind of detrimental, but I love the title. Sure. I love yacht rock. Yeah. You can, and that was the first time I ever heard the term yacht rock. And there was people online saying, you know, I made up the term Yacht Rock in 2010. I go, there's a, 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 you know, a review of the record <laughs> saying Yacht Rock right here, you know, because people are very proprietary of the term. Like I couldn't use it. Never mind call a record Yacht Rock or, ins or assume or insinuate that Sugar Ray was a Yacht Rock band. I mean, there's <laughs> right. so much weirdness on that. But yeah, no, that was it. And we also covered uh, Pina Colada. Uh, Do you like Pina Colada? Sure. You know, uh, which is like the ultimate Yacht Rock song. So we just felt like a little bit of connection. I knew we'd get a little bit of love because of the little Yachty, because of the rapper and all that. And he sent me a, uh, a, a message in my Twitter saying, hey bro, I love that title, I'm a big <laughs> fan. And that was huge, I yeah. wasn't expecting that at all. So it was fun to make that record, Scott. You know, you know what's great making a record with no commercial expectations? Because when you're in a band, you do two things. You play live and you write songs. And we'd been playing live a lot. We just hadn't been able to scratch that itch, and especially not in a major label. BMG put that out. So we knew it was going to get to people, which was a lot of fun. And being on Big Brother, uh, that led to the record deal. So it kind of fed the flames of Sugar Ray again. You know, they're like, oh, you got a little bit of a song. Our, our guitar player submitted a song. BMG heard it. I was on Big Brother then. Everything made sense. Perfect timing again. So we got to make that record, which was a lot of fun. You know, making a record just for yourself. It's great. It, it, it's so yeah. liberating, you know. We just had on uh, Rob Harvilla, who did a book called 60 Songs That Explain the 90s. Yeah. Do you feel like there's like a newfound appreciation for the 90s now that you think about it? I mean, when we were living through it, I feel like people didn't appreciate that decade as much as now, but there's this incredible newfound interest in the 90s. And so there's a lot of things that are great about the 90s that I yeah. still love and a lot of things I look back on and I don't reminisce and think it was great. How do you feel about it now that you reflect back on it? Yeah, I think we all look back on decades with rose-tinted sunglasses. Yeah. It's just, it's on, it's, it's, it, it's just, you have to do it. You know, you it's like a relationship. You only remember the good parts. You know, you don't remember the bad. And the 90s were fun. Uh, my dreams came true in the 90s, but I wouldn't say, what a great decade. Everything <laughs> was perfect. You know, there was a lot of problems in the 90s, like any decade has. A lot of great, great as well. So I think we're riding that nostalgia claim. I say, Scott, it takes 15, 20 years for the stink of that decade to go away. Believe me, I still have frosted tips. So I, <laughs> I know it takes a while. I never got rid of these things either. Uh, so it takes a while for it to go away. So I think we're, we're, uh, we're experiencing that wonderful nostalgia, which is a bad word to some people. I love it. I embrace it. You look up the word nostalgia in a dictionary, all wonderful adjectives. A time I wish I could go back to. A, a memorable time of my life. I, I just don't get it. And I understand a lot of bands still want to be relevant. They just want to give, and I get it, man. So do I. So do I. But nostalgia is not a bad place to rest your hat. You I don't know? know if we need to bring back the hammer pants. Those are pants that I think can stay in the 90s. But I disagree. <laughs> I, I love hammer pants, man. As an Irishman, you know, it really gives me a lot of a lot of flow down there. But I, I will say I've noticed, too, because I do a lot of corporate shows where they'll hire a professional band and they'll hire a bunch of 
singers to come in and do, do their hit songs. And it's all about the 90s. It's all, you know, look at a couple other decades just to be like, you know, have a variety there, but the 90s are really cracking right now. And I know for us, and, and as a live draw, we've never been the biggest live draw, even the pinnacle of Sugar Ray, never sold a lot of merch, you know, but we're, we, last year we, we did a tour with the Gin Blossoms, uh, Tonic, and uh, Fastball. And, you know, we were drawing three, 4,000, 5,000 people a night. That very tour five years ago, 1,500. 2000. So there certainly is a uh, 90s wave happening. Definitely. Are there plans for another Sugar Ray record coming up? Not yet. I'm always writing, you know, and if, if an instance comes up and an opportunity where it's easy to do, great. You know, I don't see a lot of enthusiasm for the, the stuff that wasn't the hits, you know, and I get it. Listen, I don't want to hear new bands, new stuff either. I don't. And I like these bands. So I totally get it. It's the bathroom break. Well, exactly. Yeah. You know, I, 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 it's funny you say that because like, we play a new song. I go, all right, I'm going to warn you. It's just full transparency. This is a new song. Go get your beer. Go take a pee. Whatever you got to do. You've been warned, okay? <laughs> uh, and again, that self face thing makes them sit and watch the song anyway. But yeah, so I, I don't. I'm never say never, Scott, because I love writing songs. I don't love the studio process. I got to say, I'm not a guy who can hang in a room with seven dudes with no windows, breathing on each other. It's not my thing. You know what I mean? Um, so I've never been a studio rap by any means, but I'm willing to put in the work to get to the end. Well, I'm sure there's a ton of projects coming up for 2024. You always have a million, you're like the busiest guy in show business. So <laughs> I'm sure there's a lot of stuff coming up. You won Rock and Roll Jeopardy, I think three times. Three so times, the, three we times. do these like top five lists that kind of go viral. Yeah. I guess where you and I kind of got it reintroduced again through our friends Josh and Gina Abraham. Yeah. So I got to ask you a couple questions coming up. Can sure. you, you know, Spin Magazine came up with a list 2021 of their top five greatest rock stars of all time. So I wanted to see if you could, and again, this was back in 2021, but I want to see if you could see who you think were their top five rock stars of all time, starting with number five. Okay, so with number, number five, that's that's tough to go down to five, you know, and, and go down. Can I start with number one? Sure. It's easier for me. Number one's David Lee Roth, and there's no argument there. Well, I agree, but he's not, Don't on, say this, Mick Jagger. He's not he, on this top five. <laughs> but I agree with you. He's great. That's insulting. Yeah. All right. Okay, well, I'm there, sure he's on the top hundred, but this is actually their 100? top hundred. David Lee Roth is number one to anybody that knows. There is no, I mean, look at it, look at the, what he spawned. There were no real one front of the men, greatest, right? one of the greatest. There was front men that were playing their yeah. role. David Lee Roth said, "Look at me," and also all of his rap, all of the everything. Have you ever heard like an old thing of him like promoting a show? Like I, there's a there's a thing on YouTube, and go look it up if anybody has the time. Uh, he's on Rodney on the Rock, and it's like you know. Rodney Bingenheimer show, sure. like, like 77, 78. He's promoting his show. And he's like, all right, ladies and gentlemen, come on down to Starwood because tonight it's going to be, yeah, just the da most David Lee Roth, inch uh, there was nobody ever like him. And he's still like that. I did a show with him a couple months ago <laughs> and he's just still David Roth full blast. So to me, he's number one. I'm going to go number two. I'll do Mick Jagger because you got to throw him in anybody's top five. That has to be in the top Not five. on the list, but one of his band members is on the list. You said, oh, you said rock stars? Rock I'm doing, stars, rock stars, rock stars, rock stars. I'm gonna have to change We can my... take it back if you want. Well, by, the, by the way, David Lee Roth was on this show. I lost the mic for two hours. I didn't know what was going on. Yeah. I don't even know what the hell the interview was about, but did people you... asked me the craziest interview I ever did was that interview, still oh, I'm to sure. this day, okay. four years ago. The Japanese have a word for it, Scott Lips. It's called Yagakazu. When you go down there, when you get the swords, and you get the robes, and you get the full Japanese experience. Zen on this side, tribulations on the right side. I don't care what word salad David Lee Roth says, I am in. Completely. I didn't know what was going on. I, yeah. lo I lost control of the show, but, but I guess I will take okay. it back. Okay, the so top rock five star, greatest yeah. rock stars of all time. Forgive me, I got in front, man, for a second. Sure. So, so Keith Richards is for sure in that He's band. number one. Oh, he's great. Yeah, yeah. I, I would say rock stars for sure. Jimi Hendrix has got to be in there. Hendrix is number three. Yeah, Hendrix number three. Uh, Jim Morrison's got to be in there. He's top 10, but he's not on this list. Okay, Axl Rose? Not on this list. Okay. Um, like rock stars, you're gonna kill, are you going to include the Beatles as rock stars? I mean, they're not in the top five. But, right, uh, but they're in the mix there? They're in the mix. Okay, um, who else am I going to say? Forgive me a second, because I take these things very, very seriously. Well, so from, we, we got one and we got three, one being Keith Richards, three being Hendrix. I, I, you know, Iggy Pop would be a rock star to me. Not top five, but on the list. <laughs> Jeez Louise. Um, what about... Um, Forgive me, man, because I, I take these things very, very, very seriously. <laughs> well, I can give you a hint. Yeah, give me a hint. Give me a hint. So, Zeppelin? Oh, okay, yeah. Jimmy Page, yep. for sure. Number Jimmy four? Page. Uh, he was number four? Yeah. Okay. Is Pete Townsend on there? No. We still have number two and number five to go. Number two rock star. Um, are any females on there? Not in the top five. Okay. Well, I got a problem with that. Uh, I'll give you a hint. Min Sid Vicious? Min Sid Minneapolis. Vicious? Oh, Minneapolis? That's a hint. Uh, Prince is a rock star? Number two, Prince. 
You know, a prince to me transcends anything. Like yeah. he's just like religion. You know what I mean? But I, I agree with Prince, probably the best guitar player on that lineup, yeah. and I'm including Jimi Hendrix. And number five, I'll, the hint I'll give you is Chameleon. A Chameleon, Madonna. Bowie. Oh, Bowie, 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 for sure, Bowie. <laughs> you know what's crazy? Think of that list, nothing new. Yeah. Nothing after yeah. like what, 75? Yeah. That's true. So again, back to our top five, the top five- I told you I need another one of these things. <laughs> I'm losing my mind, dude. I can't think anymore, it's so frustrating. <laughs> Mark McGrath, the top five one hit wonders of the 90s. Okay. Your list. You've got to go with, with number five. Okay, I'll go with number five. I'm going to go with um, How Bizarre by OMC. Great. Just a great song. Great track. Uh, Chumbawamba could be higher, but I'm going to put it at number three. I'm going to put Hey Wait. Macarena at number four. Okay. Okay. At number two, I'm going to put um, oh, we okay, added Vanilla, this. Vanilla Ice is going to be number two. Good pick. Yeah. What, what, what's left? Do you know? Number one. Oh, number one? The number one. Did I say a number, number one? Number one, top one hit wonder of the 90s. Man, right said Fred. I'm Good too one. sexy for sure. my... Sure. I thought you might have mentioned Fastball because I know you had a relationship with them. Great because song, Because Fastball, if you call them a one hit wonder, you're wrong. Yeah, they have, they have more... Yeah. Out of my head, number three. Sure. The Way, yeah. number 13. The Way, great track. And number The Way was number one. I had Fastball in my head, but I couldn't... They're not a one yeah, hit wonder. that's true. That's There's true. also a song called Firescape that got number eight on the alternative tracks too as well. I've done my research, guys. So, and I love the band too. They're, they're awesome. Such great guys. Besides my buddy who I'm having dinner with tomorrow night, Matt Pinfield, I think you love might Matt. you might know more about music than anyone else I know. And John Barbados. I think the three of you know more about rock and roll trivia than anyone in the world. So, well, well Scott, it's always fun. I'm sorry to interrupt you. People during my heyday would go, "Dude, you're the best trivia." I go, "Nope." Matt Pinfield is so much better. It's not even close. There's Matt Pinfield and everybody else. I agree. It's like Jordan in basketball. There's some pretenders, but he's the Michael Jordan of music trivia. There's no way this knowledge didn't help in your songwriting, by the way, because you have such an incredible knowledge. I'm sure that really helped you in your songwriting process. Well, let me, let me give you a perfect example of that. In the song Fly, uh, 25, 25 years old, my mother, God rest her soul. There was a song by Gilbert O'Sullivan called Alone Again Naturally. Naturally, it goes, uh, Alone Again Naturally. It says... Um, 65 years old, my mother, God rest her soul, couldn't understand how the only man. So that was, you know, that was inspired by, for sure. I just changed, I just flipped, a little flip right there. So there are little little chestnuts of that, especially on the first record. There's germs influences, sure. there's Prince influences, yeah. you know. So we've always had through little Easter eggs, at least I did. Because yeah. I'm not the best songwriter in the world, but I had to write some lyrics. <laughs> <laughs> this is going to be a fun one for you. Mark McGrath, the top five debut albums of all time, according to you. Okay. Starting with number five. Okay, starting with number five. Okay. Um, it's hard to go from number five, bro. Can I go from top? Sure. The, number the one. Be, the best debut record of all time, without a doubt, is Guns N' Roses' Appetite for Destruction. It's, it's not... I agree. It's not, you can't really argue it, okay? But people try to with Van Halen's first record, which is great. My only, my only, uh, my only condition on that is that there was a couple covers on that. There are no covers on Appetite. Number three is Boston. Great record. We skipped over two. Oh, I'm doing one, two, three. Okay. <laughs> no, no, number one is uh, appetite. appetite. Number two is uh, is what did I say it was? Well, Boston was number no, three. No, Van Halen's number oh, two. Oh, Van Halen. Okay. Van Halen's yeah. number two. Boston's number three. Uh, Lemonade and Brownies by Sugar. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, no, there's so many so good ones. Um, so we're on number four. Number four would be, I mean, Beatles' first record. Yeah, you have to. I mean, you have to include them, or you'd be a moron not to. Okay. And number five would be, I'm going to say this. And technically, it might not be, but I think it's the first one. Straight out of Compton, mm. doing number five on that one. Awesome, great list. And uh, last but not least, your top five desert island discs, according to Mark McGrath. You know, it's interesting. I, when I was on Big Brother, I actually had a chance to kind of do this, and meaning that I'm, when you're on Big Brother, there is no internet, there's no radio, there's no reading. You can't read anything. The oh. only thing they give you is the Bible, the King James version. That is it. I wouldn't survive. Yeah, no. <laughs> and you know, Scott, music's always in my head, so I've been going. They go, Mark, please stop whistling from the piano. I'm not kidding you. Because you just find yourself singing through the day because you're so bored, uh, you know? I'd be like, Unchained, Mark, no way, dude, cut it. So, like, I know how, what it is to like, live in absolute boredom. And then if you win the head of household, you win the challenge for that week, you get to listen to one CD of your choice. Now, that was like water after being in the desert. So this is really, really uh, close to me. So I had a chance to actually pick out my number one. And after a lot of deliberation, a lot of stress and emotion, my number one, and I'm include greatest hits on this because sure. I'm going to, was Legend by Bob Marley. It's the one that I can listen to forever Great record. and ever. Timeless. Over and over, and it makes me feel good. 
Actually, field day. And that's what it's about. Yeah. It's your desert island disc. For sure. For sure. So number two would be a Frank Sinatra, greatest hits, anything like that. Again, just puts me in a great mood, excellent mood. Oh, you know what? I forgot the Sex Pistols debut record. I'm so mad at myself. <laughs> you can't be a desert island disc and not be in, you know, in the thing. Yeah. That's top five debut, you mean? Yes, yeah. of course. Yeah. To me, it's one of the best of all time. Just Guns N' Roses' success as a band eclipses it. But it's it's an untouchable record, never mind bollocks. Um, so I'll be bringing that at number two, at number three. Um, got, a little, got to mix it up a little bit. I'm going to put Chardet's greatest hits at number four because I'm by myself. Actually, I probably should get rid of that if I'm by myself. <laughs> <laughs> you are by yourself. It's a desert island I know, disc. but I'll, I'll keep it because you know, Chardet, I can have my own fantasy. It's a romantic record. Yeah. I've never got past the first song in my own love life, but you know that's on me. Uh, and number five, this is going to be a, a, a funny one because I've got to dip into my hair metal, love of hair metal. So I'm going to take um, Cocked and Loaded by LA Guns. I effing love that record. I performed a lot of those songs. I know you did. I know you did. <laughs> Interesting well, choice, but yeah, great choice. I like, love Cocked and Loaded. Dude. And you know what it reminds me of? Just such a great time in my life. And that would yeah. be important to me. Like It really has you know, just real vivid visual memories for me. Tune in for the next podcast. Mark and Scott talk about only hair metal yeah. for two hours. <laughs> I'd be honored, bro. <laughs> <laughs> and last but not least, because I was thinking about your love of trivia and your knowledge. Uh, it, I don't know if you know the, the answer to this, but if you can answer, you know, who was the singer the singer who turned down Zeppelin and Deep Purple. There is one singer who was asked to join both Zeppelin and Deep Purple and refused. This stumped me too, by the way. Yeah, no, that's that's an interesting question. I'm I'm shocked that it doesn't I don't know it immediately. Uh, Zeppelin and Deep Purple. Was it Glenn Hughes? Oh, Glenn Hughes sang in Deep Purple. Um, I can I, give you a hint. Yeah, give AKA me a hint. Super Lungs. Oh, Super Lungs. Um, I don't know. I, I stumped you. I, it's so you hard to stump me. you. No, it's not. I can't remember anything more. <laughs> I need more of this, man. Hook me up. Terry Reed, a.k.a. Super Lungs, oh, asked God. to join both bands. God. He did recommend Plant and Bonzo to Zeppelin, so in the end, it all worked out for everyone. Terry Reed, man. Did you, did, you, did Terry Reed do anything after that? Not I mean, he toured, you know, I think in Europe he was a big deal. I know Aretha Franklin went on to talk about how great he was. And at a certain point, she said, there's only five things happening in London at this point, And Terry Reed's one of them. So not much, but uh, I've seen interviews with him where he's talked about the fact that he got to join the band. He turned it down. Imagine that call that you get from Paige. You're like, I don't, I'm a little busy. He was touring with the Stones at that point. Oh, okay. So he had gotcha. to put it on ice for a little bit. And at that point, they went and got plant. What was but, he doing uh, with the Stones? Like, it, what, what? I think it was opening for the Stones at oh, that okay. point. Oh, okay. So, I see what yeah. you're saying. Gotcha. I thought was actually in the stones. I, yeah. don't, I don't recall that era. I'm excited for the next podcast. I'm excited. What, what 2024, anything going on that we should talk about? You know, I'm more just, touring. I'm, I'm constantly playing music for a living. I travel for a living. That's what I do. I say I have four songs. We'll travel. Okay. Acoustic, acapella, my band, your band, your tracks, <laughs> my tracks, my drummer, your drummer. And I've got these four songs that people want to hear. I'm grateful for them every day. And so that's what I get to do. It's, you know, I'm not a guy that's like, oh, I need to do something different. I'm really happy in my lane right now. You know, I've got two kids, a 13 year old twins that I'm raising, and it's really fun. I'm gone a lot. So when I come home, that's what I do. So I kind of like, my time, I'm, it's, I know it's got a full calendar already, looking at tours in the summer. I'm also on Sirius XM. I got a little thing I do there every now sure. and then. Uh, and so that's it. I'm anxious to see what's next, Scott, because I'm always uh, open for opportunities, you know? More we'll Royal see. Machine gigs, maybe? Come yeah, up. that's the most fun thing yeah. I can do. That's you know, like every uh, who's who, Tyler, whoever, right? David Ozzie. Lee Roth. David yeah. Lee Roth is what I did with Royal Machines. Got to jam with Shirley Manson from Garbage. You know, you never know who David, who Dave Navarro and, you know, Donovan Leach and yeah. Billy Morris are going to bring it. I can't. All my friends. Josh Freeze is sure. a drummer of Royal Machines, but he's not busy with that other man. <laughs> you know, and so it's just such a wonderful, fun thing to be a part of. You know, we're overpaid and underworked in that one. <laughs> and I never thought in a million years. And, you know, I, as I said, the Sex Pistols are my favorite band. The uh, Royal Machines gave me the opportunity to play a Sex Pistols song with Steve Jones, Amazing. Paul Cook, and Glenn Matlock. Incredible. Played you were in e the Sex Pistols. Played EMI was for a day. <laughs> and Paul Cook, and I swear to God, said this. He goes, Mark, I haven't heard the phrasing of those pistol songs since we recorded the record. And I just went, again. And I'm I was, done. done. Yeah. I, I don't, I'm, I'm going to quit. I quit music, you know. And then that note, this is a blast. We got to do this again I'd some love more. to. And awesome. Scott, thanks for having me, man. Thanks I really for coming, bro. It was a pleasure. Yeah.